I feel like telling you to grab a cup of something so I can tell you a story. I'm sitting in a parking lot of a vacant church that I've talked about before. This is the church. Big empty land. And so I had a vision, not this past um, Christmas, but the Christmas before. And <clears throat> I saw this church. Um, I drove by it all the time. I saw this church and I saw it being a space for community that didn't otherwise have kind of a sacred space to be community. Um, I saw the stage or their pulpit. It's a stage. Um, I saw that being a place where people could do uh, spoken word, where people could try out um, different busking techniques, um, where people could tell stories, where people could practice their um, their storytelling arts, you know, where bards could be born. Um, I saw all kinds of amazing things that I would want to see um, because it was my vision. I was putting myself into the vision, you know. Uh, I don't really know where visions come from. I think that there's probably, I think we're part of a collective consciousness. Um, and I think that, um, I think it doesn't matter where they come from. I think that we get a download, like a tarot card, tarot card, um, is like a download. And then you go to somebody who helps you get the downloads and then they unpack them for you and they give you a bunch of meaning. But the meaning is, is filtered through who they are and what they believe and what makes sense to them. So this vision that I had of this place, if I had had something to do with it, would look very different than what it's going to look like. And that's natural because the people who actually acted on the vision, so I had the vision and I kept it kind of secret at first. I only told a couple of people and somebody came with me to the, the I know that's why I know it's Christmas. Somebody came with me to um, the service that Christmas and we talked to the pastor to like find out like what was going on. And he explained that they were just renting it on Sundays that, um, that it had been mostly abandoned, that they really were just renting it. Um, and then the land had been sold or something like that. And there was some sort of development project. There was something going on. Um, but whatever it was had been stalled. Um, so, and we talked cause they're not from, they weren't from this community to begin with. Um, they were from another community and they drove like a long distance and like their population was really dwindling. I think there was maybe like 25 people, maybe 30. And they were like people who had been part of the, um, part of the church for forever. There's a couple of families, I guess, that started it. And so we talked about like what that was like and, you know, like what they were doing because they were talking about doing, um, all kinds of reaching out to, um, the, um, underserved population of the town that they're actually from and like they weren't really talking about doing anything for Ashland and I'm like isn't it kind of weird that you're like in a church in Ashland but you're not doing anything for the Ashland community he's like but that's not where we're based so anyway it seems like they go they went and found something um I guess closer to where their community is and so this church has been vacant completely for over a year it's way overgrown and I, I come here a lot to meditate um because parking lots are are my churches guess. <laughs> um, gosh, that's so true. I spent so many years of my life, community and parking lots. Um, Rocky Horror Picture Show at Middlesex Mall in New Jersey um, when I was 18 comes to mind. Um, everything I know about community I learned in a parking lot. It's a good book. Um, So I'm sitting here in this church parking lot and I was at a meeting two nights ago where I heard people talking about this church that's about to become a shelter. And I'm like, is that my church? Is that the church that, and I go and ask a bunch of people, I'm like, how long has this plan been in place? They're like about four months. So about six months ago, I think, um, I, I finally let go of me having anything to do with this vision. The vision actually asked me whether or not I, I was still interested in being its host. Um, and I said, no, because I, after the smoke started in July here, I just, I couldn't, it was fire season again. I, I don't know how to live through fire season unless I'm underground. Um, I think I would have to have an underground oasis that didn't feel like it was underground where I was getting um, natural light 
simulated, I don't know, well enough that I didn't notice that I was underground. You know, like in a casino, you, you don't really notice. The environment is such that you don't notice that you've been in there and it's suddenly dark or suddenly light or whatever. It would have to be the same thing in an underground space. But otherwise, I don't know how to survive fire season. It's scary. It's, I'm, it's utterly terrifying, actually. Um, living out of a vehicle in fire season is, is, is a tremendous privilege. Um, and I feel like fire season would be a good justification of, of, you know, vehicle living becoming more normalized and supported and making vehicles that of course you could sleep in them. Why, why wouldn't you do that? And of course we make like packaging, if we're going to make plastic things that we make plastic things that become useful for other things later. Um, like, of course we're doing that. Like, why would we be poisoning our food and water supply? Like, so anyway. there's a shelter going to be at this church and it's because I released it I, past me would be utterly appalled that I'm telling you this story and that I'm going to put it on the internet. Um, because it makes me sound crazy. I think that I had a vision and I, I incubated it and I gave it love and then I put it out there and then it took on a life of its own and it, it's kind of my child in a way, you know, it came from just sitting here in this parking lot, like looking for, looking for a place where I could be at peace, um, in the presence of, I don't know, the sun, really. Um, and I kept thinking about all these underutilized spaces and what it would look like if we had like benevolent property management where like the job was to go make sure that properties had all the their needs met like you know places that needed to have um work done we made sure that there was the connection between the person who can do the work the person who can fund the work and the person who needs the work and that we created some sort of system where instead of all these independent go fund me's and stuff I, imagine the great depression with the internet. Just go back in history and look at the Great Depression and see what the Great Depression looked like. Now add the internet. We all have something that we could give that would be a drop in the bucket. And if there were a good conduit for everyone's drops in a bucket to be collected, and distributed to where it needed to go, we wouldn't need government. We wouldn't need Social Security. We wouldn't need Medicare. We wouldn't need any of this stuff. If we all could somehow contribute the drop in a bucket we have and put it into a pool, if every single person on the planet could donate one penny and there was an effortless way of collecting it and an effortless way of putting it back out, and if there was a contractually benevolent corporation, which is not yet a thing, a contractually benevolent corporation that was in charge of connecting us, that was in charge of the, not in charge of connecting us, in charge of, this is why it's not yet a thing, because I can't wrap my brain around what it would even look like, right? But the need that it fills is this, a situation where we were all able to put a drop in the bucket would mean that we were all actually connected. And in a world where we have a ton of stranger danger, that's kind of scary. And we're not wrong for having stranger danger. There are people who have belief systems that if we fully showed up exactly how we were, their belief system could, be in could endanger us, right? There are very few people who that doesn't apply to, uh, that doesn't apply to, and those people have a tremendous amount of privilege in this world. That's what privilege looks like in this world, is um, matching the programming of the, the bucket that you're in. Um, and in a world where we're all connected like that, what we need in charge is something that's contractually benevolent, an entity, because an entity will arise. It, it, I don't see any way for it. 
I love it. I love the idea of anarchy and I love how my friends define it. And I love the idea that we don't need governance, um, that we, if we're all really connected and we understand that what I do to you, I do to myself because we're all connected. If I understand that what I do to that, the environment I do to myself because I am of the environment in a world where we understand all that, we don't need governance, but we're so not there. I mean, that's not the reality that we're living in. It's the reality I'd like to see happen. I don't see that happening on a, well, maybe I can see it happening on a large scale in my lifetime. What would it take? It would take interrupting every instance of hungry, tired, scared, alone, and in pain. And creating circumstances that were different than, and anyway. So I'm sitting at this church. And there's not a contractually benevolent corporation in charge of this. This is a, what's called a grassroots um, thing where there's a need and then the dots get connected, how they get connected and the nourishment comes from wherever it comes from and the seeds come, whatever it comes from. And then when you water it, it grows and it looks like whatever it looks like. And then it works for a while and it probably overgrows in some areas and it probably undergrows in some areas. And sometimes it collapses and sometimes an entity comes over, comes and takes it over and says, okay, this is mine now. I can do it better. And usually they're in the, in this case, in the shelter case, they're in the the medical kind of paradigm where we're treating people in a, in a medical capacity, which may or may not be, you know, conducive to thriving. Um, and then it leaves out all the people who don't have the privilege of fitting in with the medical mindset. So all the people who like, you know, wouldn't ever take an antibiotic because that's, that's anti-life and we're life. Why would, why would we put something in us that's anti-life? Um, you know, it, why would we do that? Um, why is it so normalized that we do that? Um, those people, they don't get the help in the system that's putting 80% of the effort into helping 20% of the people. And those 20% of the people are the most vulnerable. And those 20% of the people are most able to be helped by the paradigm that takes over these things. So there's a paradigm that's taking over this thing, which is allowing a very small number of people to get a lot of help, which is great. And I'm not against that. That's not the vision I had for this place, but it wasn't mine. But I, get, I have a bunch of points here. The first point is that if we have an idea for something, we don't need to get better at doing things. We need to get better at telling stories. So find people that it would be difficult to tell that story to and like understand what it is that would make it difficult Go do some self-work, clear some stuff, meditate, own whatever it is you do to clear your, your mental static, whatever mental hygiene practices you have, employ them. And then go tell the story to people that it's easy to tell the story to, that are going to pat you on the back and go find your fans and tell them your stories. If you think you know how to fix, fix this, there's nothing wrong here. If this is, we are reaping what we have sown. There's nothing wrong here. It's a reflection. We are being shown what we have been sowing. We are being shown what we've cultivated. We're being shown what's the darkness inside of us so that it can come up to be cleared. There's nothing wrong here. And it's hard to say that when you're in the middle of it. Anyway, 13 minutes and 45 seconds I have been talking. I hope your cup of something has been um, interesting. Um cup of something in story time. I didn't finish talking about the contractually benevolent corporation and it's important to me. I tell the story in my head of the founding fathers of this country. They were sitting around a pub and thinking, there's land over there. Like, there's no rules. What if we made some? I mean, there's no rules. We made them up. And so there's no rules that say corporations have to have the alignment that they do. You know, we talk about evil corporations. Evil is lack of benevolence. Evil is lack of empathy. Um, we talk about corporations that have no empathy and have no benevolence and any entity sufficiently large enough to take control over 
large pieces of our environments and our bandwidth and anything that's able to do that is likely to become evil. But what if there was a contractual benevolence clause? Like what if as we were creating a new nation, we created a whole new paradigm for corporations and started creating infrastructure to accomplish things that we want to see, even if those things are unlikely. So let's create infrastructure that creates contractually benevolent corporations. So that corporations like if Coca-Cola decided all of a sudden they like wanted to be benevolent, it was like, okay, you know what? I think we've contributed to the obesity problem and, and the decline of society in general enough. You know, what would it look like if we weren't doing that anymore? And then when they started to implement those procedures, that they had some kind of thing where they were beholden to the people that were their consumers, that were, um, that were part of their paradigm, that they, they somehow had an obligation to do things that were in the acts of goodness. And we had like smart people that were like meeting regularly to figure out what actually is goodness. What actually is in our best interest? People who are truly qualified to answer those questions. And it's not governance. It's we do our due diligence before we take action. You know, so before we decide to cut down that rainforest, we've done some due diligence. And we spent some time with the animals and we've spent some time observing them and seeing like, you know, well, is it more important to protect their environment or is it more, it, more important to make us more profit? You know, um... And we have people who are really thoughtful and well-fed and nourished and have all their needs met answering these questions because why wouldn't we be doing that? I'm going to go back to meditating myself. I wanted to share a bit of it with you and some of the downloads and where I've been. I think the paradigm has shifted, y'all. I don't think we have to tell the old stories about the suffering of the past anymore. I think we can talk about them in terms of our shared trauma. We have a shared trauma where we have, we have come through many things together. And um, I think often of the meme of um, Alice from Alice in Wonderland and Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz sitting next to each other and one says to the other, I've seen some weird shit, man, <laughs> or something like that. It's like... I've seen some weird shit. And if the all of us that have, have done that and have a smile on our face afterwards got together and started telling these stories and people who make documentaries and people who make music and people who make songs and people who need muses, they came and sat in and they like used us as muses, you know? I think telling stories can change the whole world. And I think we have the perfect access for it. I think we have the internet. <laughs> 